recording in progress. <laughs> right. So wow. Crazy. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi. It's us. You got some great uh, fringe hair fringe going on there, but yeah. right? It was yeah. just like, yeah, he's so he's so emo. Oh yeah, my god. Oh, it. and he's he's shedding. Oh, he's nervous. He's just because he's, he's he, yeah, he's nervous. He's old. He's an old mm-hmm. man now. Um, hello everybody. It's Daggercast. Welcome to it. Um, it's it's me, Lindsay Charles. Uh, a lady. Her hair is green now that's that's what i am right now i still yeah i'm just still suffering from daycare colds from a toddler and uh it's tuesday so i've literally worn no makeup it's a podcast why do i need makeup being green is it or is it not easy being green you know what it's it's actually easier you know like when they say blondes have more fun no girls with green hair have a damn blast so that's 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 (laughs) that's what i I've, i've wanted to dye my hair green since like like two years because you can't dye your hair when you're pregnant or whatever. It's stupid. Well, anyway, I, started, I love you. My, I was, my oh, oh, I was going to introduce you. Okay, it's, go ahead. It's my favorite big gay horror it. fan, Brian Kirst. Hey, well, I was starting out nervous this podcast once again. Now I'm just jealous because I don't have green hair. So, oh, well, so, I mean, uh, I've got all these conflicting emotions going. I on. think it is. You can do it. I, I think you it. could pull it, it off, right. dude. You could totally right. pull it off. Yeah. Like a toxic green. Hell yes. <laughs> mine's already like mine's already like coming out too. So it, it's fine. Then I'll just be a blonde again. It'll be fine. There you go. But um, well, we are. I'm very do. excited. There to, are worse things yeah. you could do. I'm so excited about our guest. Oh, but we should talk about Daggercast in general. Right, um, hello, thank you for being here. Um, if you want to speak to us, please contact us on all of these social media sites. We're on them all: Instagram, Facebook, um, and then um, if you want to email us, it's DaggercastInfo at gmail.com. And um, I don't know. Please let us know what we should be listening to, uh, reading, uh, looking at. Vid- like all the movies all the tv we're uh we're happy to uh i don't know happy to answer any questions and stuff i it's i mean this is all about collaboration and talking about representation and film and i don't know we 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 want we want to hear from you well we have got a great guest for representation and film tonight. i'm excited I, I must say i must say um i met this adorable creature a number of years ago at uh, a con and i've been lucky enough to have her in my life ever since from afar but we are together again um she's a survivor she's been in the business for many many moons so many facets to her personality she's courageous and beautiful and wonderful she um it was the lead in invasion of the space preachers which has taken on a life of its own um it's uh, been distributed by Troma. So any of you cult film fanatics out there should know the film. And if you don't, shame on you. And you will know about it now and you'll seek it out after mm-hmm. this interview. And uh, she also um, was just part of the amazing background cast who were so involved with Halloween Kills. And so we're, we kind of feel like we're on the, a hot track as Woo! Halloween Kills is so uh, important and, and vital right now. So uh, we're going to talk to her about about her life and and being on the set of Halloween Kills and about the diversity, which I thought there was a lot of actually in Halloween Kills. Um, Absolutely. Really great stuff. Big John, Little John and and, uh, (laughs) uh, the doctor and nurse couple, the black couple who I loved. And so without further ado, um, it is my pleasure to introduce the forever gorgeous, the always sweet and delightful Aliska Hahn. Yay! Here she is. She's coming. Here she is. is. Yay. Hey, how, how are you? It's so wonderful to be here. I was at when I was contacted by your producer. And since 2013, I think was yeah, the last time I think so. that think we so, yeah. were. This is oh, no. And Lindsay, it's your, lovely to your, meet you. Oh, thank you. Um, just FYI, you're cutting out a bit. Um, audio now, um, which is kind <laughs> okay. of funny because the, the video, the video was the thing that was cutting out before and it was not the audio. And now you're, you, you're, you look great. And now the audio is cutting a bit. Why? Okay. It's well, just, it, it will, if it now it's still happening. 
Yeah. It's still happening. Oh no. Well, let's oh, see. If, if you're you're good here, you're good right. You were good right there. Okay. You might be okay now. Okay. You know what? I'm going to um, spin okay. downstairs and uh, tell him to stay off the internet. Stay <laughs> off the internet, dachshunds. Uh, I'm just uh, picturing your dogs on the internet. I'm sorry. This is what oh, I am right. seeing. Just them like. <laughs> <laughs> well they have little t-rex arms you know yeah, they're just like i can't even well they're jealous we're, we're taking you yeah. away from them and yet, you know, <laughs> precious time mom they precious get plenty time. of time with me I, I i work from home most of the time but i am currently uh part of a, of a new feature film that's shooting in pittsburgh so nice. um, they've had to share me recently can you oh, talk about on. that or is it too soon too soon well here, let's see here. I think that my NDA prevents me from technically telling you what the title of the feature film is, but I'll give you some hints. Right. It is a feature film. It is a Netflix production. It uh, is being produced by a certain production company that may or may not be owned by a former United States president and his first lady. Um, the the movie is directed by the same director that directed Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, which is a two-time Oscar-winning film, and it may or may not star Chris Rock. Okay, awesome. A bunch of other okay. people. And they're in nature, and currently shooting in Pittsburgh. So there you go. Google. <laughs> Dude, so, I love me. I love me some Chris Rock. Chris Rock, like. <laughs> has surprised me in 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 the like fargo him and fargo that Absolutely. was that that blew my face off i also <laughs> I, I really wanted to be excited about spiral but everybody says it's so bad but um i'm happy to see him in see horror it. yeah did not avoided that one i know it's well, you're not you you said too um that you had to look away a lot when watching halloween kills so are you a horror girl? Or are you a certain kind of horror girl? Oh, you... here's, what the, here's what's kind of freaky is I I was living in Wilmington, North Carolina, um, where they filmed Halloween Kills, and I filmed a lot of the ho the hospital uh, scenes, all of the hospital scenes, and fortunately did not run face to face into, you know, MM, you know, and I didn't want to because I uh, am a woman of a certain age and I was around and aware when first Halloween, the OG came out and it's not out of me. Uh, so it has always been, uh, I've never really been afraid of Freddie uh, or Jason, Michael Myers, Mike. Okay always been my thing since I was you know a young young chick and so I did not want to <laughs> run into <him. laughs> of course when you answer a call um you you don't know because I was originally just an extra just background and within my first I think three hours on set I was uh, upgraded to feature and um but I knew I, I had not read the script, obviously, but I knew that I was going to, you know, be in, in the hospital scenes, but I didn't know if he was going to show up, you know, uh, but it was really interesting, uh, as I mentioned briefly before we, we started this evening, what was, and I'm sure I'll never experience anything quite like this ever again, no matter how long I live or where I live, but all of the exterior, all the park at the end of the street, um, the uh, all of the neighborhood scenes, that was my real neighborhood in Wilmington. All of that stuff, that, that park is where I walked the dachshunds, you know? And I'm like, oh my God, we're watching it on Peacock. And I'm like, Bubby, look, that's where you pee. I mean, it was just like, you know, <laughs> so cool. And and I can tell you everything around there. I, I mean, a two and a half to three block radius is that entire. I mean, I lived in that movie. And most of the shoots went from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. So, you know, I'd walk out into my backyard and there'd be that eerie 
could tell, you know, what part of the neighborhood that they were in. And uh, one uh, scene, the scene, kind of the flashback scene, not to, you know, do any spoilers for any of, well, oh, no, we can, any we of can your do... listeners have not seen it by now. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> this is a, this is a spoiler. This is a spoiler show. You can, you can go all the way to the end because I sure am. Okay, good. <laughs> well, the, the flashback scene where Lonnie, the young Lonnie in the, in the red jacket, you know, is kind of running and he has his face-to-face encounter with with Michael, uh, that was that was done a, a half a block down from my apartment, and they lit the whole alley behind my apartment. And I, I mean, I used to walk down even before I, I officially got on set. I, I would hang out with the crew. They were fantastic, and they were. Uh, of course, the flashback scene is from 1978. So we had to clear all of our cars off the street and have them parked blocks away so they could pull in all the vehicles that were year appropriate, um, you know, to that that mid to, to late, ni- you know, 1970s make and models of, of, of automobiles. So it was, I, I truly lived in this film and it was kind of freaky uh, to, to, to do that. And, and then, you know, go on to, uh, to film on, on the soundstage at Screen Gems, which was only about seven minutes away from, uh, from where I was living. That's amazing because it's got to be so much more immersive when it's just a yeah. little town. Um, whereas like, I don't know, like Brian, yeah, Brian and I live in Chicago or I used to, but Brian and I, like he, you still live in Chicago. And um, I, I think yeah, all Chicagoans in here know, like you'll see a movie set up down the, you know, you'll just turn a corner and be like, oh, sorry. Like you'll be right in the middle of a movie mm-hmm. set and just be like, uh. Okay. Like I'll, I'll bike through one and just be like, oh, there's the craft table. Cool. Um, right. but like, right. so it's like, uh, but I'm sure in a, in a town that size, it's probably just like, it just takes over, takes over the whole place. Well, I had experienced that, you know, uh, to a degree because in, I, I moved to Pittsburgh in 1998 originally and some that was right when movies were coming to Pittsburgh like Inspector Gadget you know I remember (laughs) with the first big ones to be filmed in Pittsburgh right after I moved there uh you know the Batman movie all of that so I was used to being in a town that hosted uh film crews but like I said to to be in such a a concentrated, I mean, it's not like it was downtown. It was where I was living. I couldn't leave (laughs) where I lived. And, and then to actually be cast in the movie. And yeah, it was, it was a little heady because I could not escape it. And so imagine being really afraid of something and you can't get away from it for about nine weeks. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh so that, man. Yeah. And so you, I had I had I had some sleepless nights. So and you never and but you never in that nine weeks had an encounter with Michael at all. No. Uh, and one of my really good friends, Braden Bunch, actually was the stand-in for um for James, for Jim. And uh I would I would have him text me and say, where are you? So I didn't accidentally come around the corner <laughs> oh. and do a face-to-face with him. So um, clever. Yeah, Brilliant. yeah. So it, it, was really, uh, it was really cool. And it, with the hospital st- soundstage, uh, you know, I mean, it was, it was amazing. It was really uh, beautifully done, but it was very tight. Um, this Haddonfield is obviously a, a small community because this hospital isn't, uh, you know, was very, very small. Um, but I mean, it was built to scale. I mean, we had a first floor, we had a second floor, you know, all of that was, you know, actual, uh, you know, actually there. The second floor was actually a second floor, not on another sound stage. So it was uh, the design of it was very interesting. But it was a very, it was bit, imagine a small town community hospital with the hallways, uh, you know, being 12 feet wide. 
and being shoved in there with Judy Greer and Jamie Lee Curtis and Anthony Michael Hall and Omar Dorsey and, you know, everybody kind of shoved in together. So we all became, uh, you know, truly a community. And uh, I will absolutely break my neck to get on Halloween ends uh, for no other reason than to work with Jamie Lee again. She, yeah. it was uh, talking about being a survivor. Jamie Lee is um, such a light. You are just attracted to her and she is so open about you know, her survival and her uh, sobriety and, you know, the things that she's overcome and been through. And she is the most giving kind, philanthropic class act, yet true Hollywood royalty. But no heirs. I mean, she, uh, you know, when we originally were doing the evil dies tonight, you know, uh, the audio for that on a couple of takes and uh, she was back in her hospital room and she came down the set out into the lobby and applauded, <laughs> that's my mob that's my mob and I remember one morning at about 2 30 or 3 o'clock in the morning and we were wait waiting for a lighting reset and she led us in a version of A Whole New World from Aladdin. <laughs> we all sang together. So just like I said, a wonderful, wonderful person uh, to, to work with. And in this scene that did not the actual movie cut, but this would be the alternate ending. And if you have not read the novelization, you can... You can read the alternate ending, but it'll be all in the steel book that's Ooh. coming in January. But anyway, this scene where she's walking with the butcher knife and, oh, by the way, that might be me there in the background. Yeah, <laughs> this we might did be you. This. Might be me. Um, we did this scene because this was the big ending scene originally. Um, we did this multiple, multiple, multiple times. And I don't know if you can see here, but she's carrying a very large bloody butcher knife. And so um, we had to do and reset and do and reset. And she and I had to pass each other during the reset. And I'm like, oh, girl, you get the out right away when you're carrying that thing. <laughs> but she was, you know, she was delightful and interacted, you know, not just with me, but with uh, other background and extra and crew. And of course, she's one of the producers on the film. And, uh, you know, this is she's very humble. Um, yet extremely talented and even after I had the good fortune to be on set with her five of her days she was only in Wilmington for two weeks and oh. I was on set with her five days um, after she left she sent um, coffee trucks for the crew that would arrive in the middle of the night and that would have cute little signs like I may be gone, but I'm still watching you. And um, I have a wow. presence actually works in uh, in LA and he did a project with her and he said, yeah, she brought, she bought the crew lasagna trucks. Nice. How cool wow. Oh, so nice. so nice. when I grow up and I finally make it in this business, you know, I want to be her. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, no, she sounds like the example, you know, like I oh, think a sure. lot of I think a lot of people who've been in movies that, you know, that long, like, you know, it, it either does, you know, does one thing to you or does another thing. But it seems that she is so I don't know, she's she's just so positive And so I'm I'm glad I'm glad that my um that my suspicions are true, like, you know, that she actually is pretty awesome. So that's, that's awesome. Honestly enough, I was not, I mean, I liked Jamie Lee Curtis. I was not a super fan of, you know, of her stuff. Um, I, I mean, I, I watched her in the sitcom and, you know, in a few movies, I mean, Freaky Friday. Yeah. I watched that with my kids, but I was not a fan, a true fanatic until I worked with her and I'm not, a, nice. it wasn't even 
that I'm a Lori Strode fan. I'm a Jamie Lee fan. I, I, I love the person she is. Yeah, it's funny. The only the only um ever time I've ever seen her like in public be just enraged is that one um somebody like took a bunch of pictures of her like yelling at someone and I don't even know what it was, but it's literally just like a picture of her going like mm. <laughs> and then there's a picture of her just like madly drinking like water. But it was like such a meme for a while. Like the people were using those images. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, because she was just like this like angry look and then just madly pounding water. Um, so I was always like, whoa, I don't want to get on her bad side. Well, She's been 42 years now in the industry as a working person, not, not to mention being a child, like I said, of Hollywood royalty and growing up in yeah. Hollywood. But being a working actor in the industry for over 42 years now without um, having encounters, you know, without being human, you know, yeah. we're, we're allowed, we're allowed to be human and, Absolutely. and have a full range of emotions and to have a, a, a set of opinions and, you know, and our own, our own life and, and, and persona that, uh, you know, we're not always in performance mode. And I respect people that, um, are raw and real and, and allow that side to come out as well. Absolutely. That's awesome. Rawness and realness. I thought in, in the film, well, like for is fantastical and over the top and, and, um, stuffed full of ideas as it was. I mean, there was a lot of diversity. Um, I think it was one of the most normal that there's only one i've had some members of the gay community kind of think that the big john little john like the the names were silly and i've mentioned not mentioned that but there's only one gay filmmaker uh, who i know who kind of didn't like big john and little john and i thought they were they reminded me of my oldest gay friends like the hippies they were the gay couple that lived in the house right yeah they they, they remodeled michael's house but um yeah but just a, a little to the music. Go, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, Liska. I was just going to tell you that house and the surrounding uh, replica community was on the next soundstage over from the hospital. <laughs> so wow. that was all, you know, a, a soundstage set. So it was kind of odd to see Pender Avenue in Wilmington built onto a soundstage with the Myers house. But um, I, I, you know, I have fallen into the trap of reading the press. You know, this is my first huge studio film. Yeah. So I have, you know, I've done the thing that I've always heard that you're not supposed to do and yep. read the message boards and read yeah. the Facebook posts. And I have seen um, some of the, you know, posts that is Michael Myers homophobic. Uh, he killed, I'm, I'm like, yeah. did you see how many people he killed yeah. before yeah. he got there? Yeah. Uh, did you miss that part <laughs> old black women firefighters uh, yeah the black i mean the black woman one was kind of for me it's just a little bit Ooh. of a oh shit like because yeah he just like slides a knife into her throat and at the Sorry. same time i'm i'm like i'm like okay like this is great seeing like an older an older black woman in a horror film pretty great and i didn't see tits was that was a- good multiracial couple too i mean they, exactly. they were a mixed couple which has if you just start thinking about the history you know, did they live in haddonfield all that time were how were they treated you, you yeah know, it's a small town i mean there, there's a lot of paths and avenues you can go down when thinking about these characters which i think is really really cool right. like yeah did, had, had they just moved there in their retirement years i mean what was their experience like so, yeah when it, was it was still a, about it was she, the lori's house being on fire <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on this podcast. Yes, you are. Yes, yes, yes. 100%. Because yes. the line, um, you know, he's like, she's a nut job or, you know, and and the uh, the woman says, oh, you better not talk about her like that. That She will fuck you up. You know? <laughs> I thought it was brilliant. And I don't know if you noticed, but in Halloween uh, two years ago, 2018, well, three years ago now, um, she was in the cemetery scene. They oh. did a lot of that. Yeah. They, they, yeah. Oh, yeah. People back. I, I think that David was absolutely visionary. This is a thinking man's Halloween. Okay. And that's why I've seen a lot of a polarization about it. Um, sure. You know, 
has too many kills. It doesn't have enough kills. You know, what does this mean? They, it, you know, I've seen you either love it or you hate it. There is, there is no middle ground, but this is a thinking man's uh, Halloween, this, well, this middle of the trilogy. I think what I thought, I don't know if irony is the best word, but there was that petition going around, silly petition about, you know, <sighs> take out the scene, like the, the firefighter thing, because yeah. you're killing people of service, et cetera, et cetera. But the thing is, this is the only slasher film I think I've ever seen where they seriously look at the devastation that comes from someone being murdered. I mean, uh, the, the, the granddaughter, you know, Lori Story's grandmother, uh, granddaughter mentions, you know, these are our family, these are people, you know, these are loved ones. Then there's the whole scene with Oscar's mom, which is just heartbreaking, where she comes oh, running into the hospital yes. and collapses. So it's one of the only films I've seen. Uh, I think it's stuffed full of ideas about the crowd mentality and, and maybe a little too much, but, but still, I mean, how brilliant that we have this slasher film that I think for the first time ever really kind of looks at what it means to be a victim and, and, and be the be the exactly parents of a victim or the and loved having PTSD and and that's the thing Haddonfield the town the town's people of which I was a part of right. um we were collectively a character in this film and a lot of people is like, oh, that evil dies tonight in the hospital scenes and the people, blah, too much of that. But, but, but truly, this was a film about trauma. That is the whole crux of this film, how this decades of trauma has affected not just the main characters now, but how this has branched out and yeah i really i really did love that part i loved the part where where you saw that it wasn't just laurie who was like being devastated constantly constantly it was right. like there are other people who literally just fell down in front of him and was like completely like scarred for life and stuff like that even though i'm sorry anytime i see anthony michael hall in a movie now i'm like that man too beefy <laughs> that man that man too beefy he's well, not like he's because such a beef boy. His defense, in his defense, um, that was a very thick sweater. Okay, <laughs> a sweater. Okay, I'm gonna tell you that uh, because he is um, he's not as bulky as that sweater, and he had a t-shirt on underneath oh, of it. Man. He yeah. yeah, he actually is a a very nice looking dude still. Yeah, that was just funny. The last time I saw him in anything was freaking what was it? Designated Survivor with Kiefer Sutherland and he's just oh this guy he's like I'm gonna kill the president and I'm just like no Anthony Michael Hall you're too beefy this is kind new, of funny he has a new project coming out called The Class and I think it's going to a streaming service but I'm not 100% on that it's definitely not a feature or a short I think it's it's uh, an episodic and but I don't know which streaming service it's it's going to but it is many parts of it play on the breakfast club and okay. yeah just you know to put a bug in your ear to to watch out for that because yes that's absolutely so you, um he actually is uh a, a very lovely person again not somebody that i was you know i thought of him as russ you know hey russ yeah. evil dies tonight you know but he he, I can tell you that very pivotal scene in the lobby, uh, I call it the apex, apex predator monologue where he's kind of rallying. Uh, that, was, that was a very, very hard scene uh, for him to get. And, and it's interesting because they, uh, they, they cut it down tremendously, but he was so focused on getting that just right. And he actually walked off set uh, a couple of times to compose himself because he kept kind of messing it up and not getting it the way that he wanted to and it was very difficult because literally you're standing in front of 40 to 50 extras uh, at least 25 crew member members and all the principal actors in this film and you're doing this big pivotal moment um but he was uh he was pro he was a pro. awesome I'm I'm curious to, uh, uh, especially for you, Brian, as well. I'm curious to see what y'all thought about the ending, um, because you were talking about being afraid of Michael Myers. I almost feel like this movie made him almost—they almost Jasoned him 
Like uh, now uh, it's like he's a uh, is he magical now? Like what is right. he? Yeah. And I'll tell and that is not the original ending. I am okay. not what I mean there's a lot of of rumors and I um I I did see a, a leak script after I I shot on the movie and and that was not that was not the original ending and I from what I understand there you will see the alternate ending which was the original ending that you know that this all was filmed for um in the DVD steel book it's, um, oh, it's so, kind of Go ahead. Oh, I'm so sorry. It, it, it's kind of interesting. Just a this whole series has so many different timelines and 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 events and and like 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 ways to read it and you know characters who people love who disappear from you know era to era. But um, you had mentioned the book before with the alternative ending. But the boyfriend of the granddaughter dies. Yes. Like in, in, in like because I, I, I do have the. 2018 novelization and he dies like really like, like it was off screen and it might even be a special feature on the original uh, uh, on the blu-ray i'm not quite sure but he on actually 2018 died. yeah he, he died i asked Santa for that for christmas yeah, yeah. i haven't seen the blu-ray i've obviously yeah. seen the movie but what was so strange is when i shot halloween kills i had not seen the 2018 version which might have you know you know just because you you would your character wouldn't have known those events correct well exactly but here's the yeah. thing that that you know because of course you know when when you something this protected including this film that i'm currently working on you sign an nda a non-disclosure agreement um and so uh you know you know, don't post anything on on Facebook or social media. Don't talk about what you see here. You know, texts, emails, all of that, because it's all very, very protected. Um, but I had a very close friend, and I said, "Hey, it's so cool." Um, I stood, and he's like, "He died in the last movie," and I'm like, "He, uh, whoops." <laughs> 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 it was a flashback. It was a flashback scene. Well, he was there today. <laughs> you know? So yeah, it was um, you know, because some obviously some of your family and friends, you know, you go through something like this and you know, things are are going to come out, but uh I had not seen 2018, so I didn't even know his character had been stabbed and run over and all this other crazy stuff. So um you had talked about community a lot and and I think obviously um the featured background players like yourself have become characters and a part of this universe and have gotten fans. And how did you work with, with the, the young actress who played your daughter? Did you audition together? Uh, what type of relationship did you create? You know, because obviously you did. I, I, I mean, you're not just being yeah. passively in the background. You're performing, you're acting, you, you, you've got characters, you're reacting to stuff. So, so what was that like building that relationship? Well, I... I really have to give major, major props to Teddy, uh, Theodore Gibbons. He uh, was the second, second AD, and he was uh, in charge of all background extras, featured extras, and all of that. And Teddy, again, is a visionary. And if you look him up on IMDb, I mean, his, um, you know, his credits are as long as, as my arm with this really cool butcher knife on it. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Fright Red. Anyway, um, he truly would create these pockets for the features featured. And he's like, okay, this, you are married to him. And this is, you know, this is your daughter. Now in this next scene, um, you know, we're going to see you, a doctor is going to come up to you and deliver some very bad news. And I want you to, you know, react this way. But um, when I got bumped up to, you know, to feature, originally my featured role was with a woman on a gurney. Um, who was being brought in, who was obviously a victim. That never made the final cut. <laughs> One of my other features was uh, was with uh, the, the young lady, Sarah, Sarah Azell, who played my daughter, and uh, a gentleman uh, that played my husband, who he somehow did not really make the final cut of the yeah. movie. 
but he has gone on, if you're familiar with the new series on Hulu, Dope Sick, that stars mm. Michael Keaton. Keaton. Yeah. Yeah, Ryan uh, plays one of the Appalachian pain clinic people in in that, and he's actually done and has a speaking role, and you know has done quite quite a bit of uh, other work in the industry and continues to do so. Um, but it's so much is just the luck of the draw. Um, I, I do know that my previous acting experience, film experience really assisted me. Uh, I'd never done background before. I was never an extra, you know, I was, you know, fortunate that I got, you know, bumped up to feature, but even as a featured extra, even as some people that, that got one lines and were bumped up to day player, um, it is a roll of the dice, you know, when it comes down to the final edit of the movie, you just never know if you're going to end up in the final edit of the movie. Um, so I, because I know how films are made, um, I would very often position myself <laughs> Um, you know, if they like there is a, a grouping where um, Judy Greer is talking to, you know, uh, Cameron, her granddaughter, she plays Karen and she's talking to the granddaughter and, uh, you know, they're all there in the hallway. And I'm like, OK, camera is there. That means they're going to be. And if I stand right about here, I'm going to end up in this scene. And and that's how, you know, I, I did, you know, some of some of my positioning. Uh, so this is this is great because this is it like it's a, it's like confirming what I was like there was a there was a movie uh, that they did at Revolution Brewing it was called Drinking Buddies um, and they said that they needed extras and I went with like my best friend Garrett and his roommate Kate and we all were like okay we just have to pretend to drink and I don't drink beer so I'm literally just holding a beer that I've just been holding forever uh -huh. And they're like, go, oh, you know, they're peppering us through this stuff. And I'm like, stand, like, I'm going to stand right there. And my hair is so big enough that you might see it on screen. So literally when I got, like, when we finally got the movie, there was a scene where, like, Olivia Wilde is, like, walking through a hallway. And I am right there. And you can 100% see. And I remember just being like, I remember having that moment of being like, I think if I stand right there exactly yeah that's exactly. so funny exactly. and and i didn't you know i didn't realize it uh you know i had my hair was very very blonde like nova blonde when i by the way i would like to i would like to like to give you massive kudos there are so many pictures of you on the internet with so many different hair colors <laughs> and you kill them all you kill them all the the video well, of you and, and brian with the red hair i was like okay yeah. mm -hmm. and then not mm -hmm. Well, I, I have, I've had the same hairstylist for the last 14 plus years. Wonderful. His name is Rick Dash. He's the keeper of the hair. Um, and I, I would, I would, I would actually travel back from, you know, other states to, to have. Nice. Oh, that's cool. But yeah, I, well, yeah, it's fun. I mean, life is a buffet. You got to try it all, you know? You do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking of the buffet again, um, Lindsay, what did you think? And, and also, Aliska, what did you think about the, the casting and the diversity? Like, I loved um, the whole twist. My favorite thing uh, in the film was um, the husband and wife team, the nurse and the doctor. He was dressed as the doctor. She was a sexy nurse. But the, the, the flip, the, the joke or the flip is that she's actually the doctor in real life and he's the nurse. Right. Uh, so, so I love all that stuff, but, but, and I loved, um, just kind was of the, that, was that, was that couple, and, was that couple, the, 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 the parents of the kid in the first movie? They were, they were shown, they had very small parts. They were shown going to the bar. Yeah. Uh, not outside. Like they, they the, were not they, the parents. They, they were, were the, the parents. The neighbor of the, the neighbor. Yeah. Boy. But they had like, they were on for like 30 seconds or something like that. Right. In the first film. Right. So, mm -hmm. so it's pretty. It, that, that's another one of those amazing kind of yeah and that's what I liked I mean I because I, I really did like the first I liked the 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 this this section of Halloween's I did like that last movie very much well um, and that's, you definitely have to see this as a trilogy yes that that everything except for the only timelines we are working with is 1963 which is the year that Michael Myers killed his sister 1978 
and then 2018 and now, and then of course next year for Halloween ends. That's all that exists in the David Gordon Green, you know, timeline. So, sure. so I could, because I've had a lot of people, you know, I, I, I've again, read the Facebook posts and boards and they're like, well, I just don't understand what happened to this person. And I'm like, that person doesn't exist in this timeline. Do, I mean, Star yeah. Wars did it, you know, why yeah. is it yeah. such a, you know, weird concept? Yeah. Yeah. Have yeah, I just recently years. watched, I recently watched Halloween three and that doesn't even have Michael Myers in it. Well, here's but. the thing. No, it does not. But in Halloween three, if I'm remembering correct, did you notice the masks? Yeah. The, this what is it the shamrock. Is it silver shamrock? Silver shamrock. Yeah. 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 Those Could not get that used. song out of my head. Right. For, oh my God. <laughs> it's all get out. Those masks were used in this movie. Yep. This oh, movie. yep. Yep, saw those. If yep. you look at yep. my yep. shirt, see when he cuts yep. the head off of one of the trick or treaters. Oh. This is all mask, and he puts that on the nurse, at, the nurse who's actually the doctor. Um, when and here's what's odd that that whole set of playground equipment. So I told you that park is actually at the end of my former street, and there is it's a city park. There was city playground equipment, but for the film, um, they came in and built, you know, a, a swing set and a little merry-go-round that was to be used for, and they left it there. Um, so it's, uh, that's where the the nurse and the doctor, you know, and of course, Marion Chambers, she has the witches. Uh, she's yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So David, um, like I said, this is the thinking man's Halloween. It's lost on a lot of people, unfortunately. Now I'm curious. Like I, would, this would have never entered my head. Um, I was getting worked on at my chiropractor, and <laughs> okay. my masseuse was like, he's, he's a horror fan as well, Chris. Um, and uh, he's like, he goes, well, he goes, he goes, someone's gonna die. He goes, in that trio, someone has to die. And he goes, he goes, in my guess, this is it gonna be Judy Greer? And that would never would have even dawned on me, dawned on me. And and so of course when it happened, I was like. That motherfucker, that Chris was right. He was right. I was like, holy <laughs> shit, she's gonna get it. And I love her. I, I loved her in this film. But now is that now is that to your knowledge part of the film? Or did they add that on during, you know, the, the, you said they changed the ending. Was that, was that a new thing? Karen was always going to die. Oh, okay. According to the the script that I read again after filming, um the, the leaked script that um that I was, uh, you know, shared, she was always going to be the one that, that died, but just in, you know, or did a she? little bit different way. Will Patton didn't die. <laughs> yeah, Will Patton right. died, but he didn't. The and boyfriend you, died, but he didn't. The sexiest man, I stood beside him and all that man had on was a pair of boxer shorts and a hospital gown and, oh, mom. I, I, I'm not surprised. He, he's, a, he's, a, he's definitely a daddy type. He's got he some charisma. I mean, when yeah. all you've got going on are socks, boxers, a hospital yeah. gown and a patch on your neck and you can still get a vibe going, you yeah. know, with yeah. a, you know, a girl in a hallway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, <laughs> Got that Ed Harris kind of thing, like he and yeah. Ed Harris. They're 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 they're, they're kind of the same type. But yeah, they they've got that sexy older man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I, I definitely a man's man, you know. Man's man. Manly man. man. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, I was not. I I have to say that I was not a fan of the ending. Um, I would have preferred the ending that as it was originally written, but my understanding, or at least the word on the street, I mean, it's not like David Gordon Green and I are besties and he consulted <laughs> or anything, um, but from what I understand um, that, you know, this with that I referred to, you know, that this scene and, and the original ending. They called the Aliska ending. <laughs> yeah. Well, it didn't quite jive because I'll tell you this, that, that Halloween end makes a time jump. So when oh. Halloween ends picks up, it's going to be four years in the future. Oh, okay. So. Yeah, it, it was interesting. Like, like I, I am always been a, 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 the underdog dude. Like, and I've liked the things like, like most people don't like. So I love the curse of Michael Myers. I love Halloween resurrection. Like, like the ones, I think it's amazing. I, I mentioned this recently um, that Buster Rhymes, a, a, a strong 
black man kicks Michael Myers butt. You, you, you know, it, it's kind of like, um, yeah, just to me, I think that's awesome. Um, I'm probably in a very small minority, but um, so- I like when Buster Rhymes kicks anything. There you go. <laughs> I, I love him. I'll watch him but, do anything all day. But it seems like they're strolling into that curse of Michael Myers territory where, where he's with, with this ending, which I, I was surprised because it is such not a fan favorite. Like, like he's right. this mystical creature who's lived for the rune stones and, and the craziness. And that was such a, like so many fans hate that. I, I'm not one of them. That, that I was surprised that it seemed that that's what they were kind of, yeah, I don't even, in, in fact, I remember sitting next to my husband saying, I don't know where we're going to go with that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but where yeah. are we even going? Yeah. Well, and yeah. also I what, the next thing comes. is, the next thing is Halloween ends. So obviously they're going to end that, you know, like, it's like, well, I've, I mean, I'm sure it, this is one of those things where I, I'm sure, you know, that it will always be open to other interpretation, but I, uh, I believe that I've seen uh, Jamie say in, in several, um, several interviews that this is her Halloween ends. This is the last movie uh, that, I mean, she wasn't going to come back to do yeah. hollow, any more Halloween movies, but David, uh, you know, his, the script and, and the way that what really appealed to her again was the trauma aspect and how they showed how, you know, decades and decades of, of, of trauma and PTSD had worn on Lori and turned her into an alcoholic and caused her to lose custody of her daughter and, mm -hmm. and the, how that generationally affected her daughter and her granddaughter and how that branched out. And again, I just thought that that was uh, really, really well done and, and very, very well thought out. Danny McBride also uh, co-wrote this script mm -hmm. and um, he was on set a couple of days that I was there. And, you know, I've always known him to be a comedic actor and just this yeah. outrageous person. So yeah. I, was, I was just really interested uh, in, uh, seeing how invested he seemed to be in that particular aspect. Nice. Yeah, I'm a big I, fan I, of it of generational trauma. It, like I, I feel like we've we're talking about it so much more nowadays, with the kind of onset of like mental health and 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 having all of that be a thing. Um, whereas, like, I don't know. I think if you'd have said generational trauma in the original Halloween, people would have that would have been like a throwaway joke. Yeah. Right. Like, what right. is this generational trauma? Like, it would have been you know, like a silly, like, thing that didn't exist in the 60s. Oh, yeah, I don't even think anybody would have understood what it was. Exactly. And and so it's cool that we're, we're, we're kind of not just bringing, like, the curse of Michael Myers into, you know, because he was in a psychiatric hospital where back in the 60s, you just threw people in there. And now, like, mental health and, and, and the way that we treat people who are mentally ill is so different that um i don't know like i almost feel like they could have gone a little further with that with michael myers where they were you know like they were trying to like interview him and like get him to like be a you know evil again or something but really like i it would have been even cooler if they'd have tried to like rehabilitate him in a way and be like see he's better and then <laughs> surprise he's not but like i don't know right now they've now they've made him just the supernatural being yeah that, that was kind the of, part i was not the the big yeah and i don't man. i don't, and also like they, they 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 took his mask off and then they didn't show us his face and i hate when i hate when any movie does that it's like whether like i don't care how iconic that mask is if you're gonna take the mask off show the face they did this like <laughs> half thing and i'm like i'm yeah. sorry why are you doing this to us? Like, either keep it on or take it off. I almost feel like people would have taken it off and then just put it back on and be like, we don't care what who you are. You you killed a bunch of people and then just killed them. I can tell you this, though, because uh, James Jude Courtney, who plays Michael Myers, is a doll baby. And <laughs> they actually, even though they, you know, just showed, you know, not even a profile, but more of a three quarter type of shot, um, that man sat in, um, 
in a makeup chair for hours because I'm good friends with the person that did his makeup. I mean, and, and attention to detail, like put the dead eye where Lori pokes his eye out with a hanger back in 1978, he had the dead eye and, wow. you know, and hard face and the whole, you know, the whole nine. Um, I'm sure so, maybe in, 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 in a movie theater, I would have been able to, to, to appreciate it. But I think because I bought Peacock to, uh, to watch it. You have not seen this in a theater? Is that what you're telling me, girl? I haven't oh. either. I've seen it four oh. times through Peacock, though. I, but no, oh my. no I, okay. I haven't gone to a theater. Ever. Both ends, all right? <laughs> Both ends. <laughs> Got to go and see this before it leaves theaters because I can tell you, um, first of all, this soundtrack, this is this is a new John Carpenter soundtrack. Mm -hmm. and oh no, I very much appreciated the music. The music is, was incredible, yeah. Oh my gosh. And in just the way that the movie was shot, um, because last year during COVID, I mean, because of course it was supposed to come out last October and um, we ended up waiting two years after production, but um, they made the decision. Uh, they made the call not to release to streaming because of course all the fans are just, just release it to a streaming service, you know, make yeah. it a pay-per-view. And, you know, David and, um, you know, Universal said, you know, no, this movie was shot to be a theatrical theatrical experience and you know of course nobody knew where we were going to be this October and I think that's why they gave people the option of you know you can see it in the theater you can watch it on Peacock so but I would I would encourage you to to do one viewing in in the theater I mean yeah, I'm in I, the movie and I've only seen it twice in the theater but I hope hey. to get <laughs> yeah i i feel like i feel like i've had to be really choosy with still having a toddler in my house yeah, yeah. i've had oh, to be a little goodness. i didn't know that of yeah I've, I've had to be just yeah. a little bit more choosy with like of going course. to movies so what i saw yeah. candy man and then i i literally i just saw dune on imax and i literally cried like that's how much i miss going to movies i know brian i know you do too brian i know like that like you and i both went to movies quite often um and now I just feel like I don't and now I have to like kind of plan it even further in advance to like really do it right um well, so yeah well, it was it's, it's very well done at least I uh, you know the both times I saw our movie in theater you know you res it's reserved seating and spaced out seating um but even movie making is such a different uh, experience now um I before, so I could go to a wardrobe, so I could get fitted to go on to set. I had to show up two days to do a COVID test. And because this is a Netflix production, the current thing that I'm working on, um, you know, Netflix and Hulu require all of their actors and crew to be vaccinated. So before you even take the COVID test, you have to present your vac vaccination card. And there is a lot of, there is a, a fair amount of pushback within the industry. It's just like, you know, you know, I don't, I don't know what to tell you, but, you know, when you are in a crew situation or in a film set situation, you know, how, uh, how can you not be? Um, but I had to show, you know, vaccine card and then go and do, um, you know, a, a swab, a fast, a fast test where we could get a result back so I can keep our wardrobe department safe because you know they're filing people in there this is like i said is a period biopic set back in the early 60s so you know it's all of that very uh very specific uh dated wardrobe and it, it takes a long time to get that appropriate and correct so Definitely. and i have i have another fitting a follow up fitting on monday and i have to go friday for another covid test yeah. <laughs> hey. so, uh, i just think it's about everyone else right you, you i'm know. sorry it's about every, like you said, it's about the crew. It's about keeping everyone safe. It's not about yourself. Right. It's about, and, and you know what? So what? You, yep. you, know, so what you, you know, just do it. You wear your mask, get your thing. It's not about you. It's not about stripping away your freedoms. It's about keeping everyone else safe, just in case, just right. in case. Absolutely. Well, I mean, we're seeing a lot. Making, 
I'm sorry. Or, yeah, no, it's fine. We're I think we're talking about the same thing. But yeah, I mean, the, the film crews are very important, and um, we're seeing currently uh, in 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 uh, in in lots of different movies, and and in the strikes that we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of movie crews not being treated well. You know, like so. Not only are we like kind of seeing, yeah, like we're, we obviously want to keep them safe. But then also like they're they're saying, hey, on top of that, because of what COVID has done and kind of the kind of what the job market is doing to pretty much every job, including film, like we're ha- we're seeing lots of places and and lots of uh, people in film crew unions be like, all right, you're going to have to treat us better. Um, yeah. Also, the the freaking Alec Baldwin situation, like our film crews are are they're in danger. They're like in danger in more ways than one. So it's really it's cool to hear like that you know at least at least somebody is looking out for them in the sense that you know hulu and netflix are making people be vaccinated that's super cool but yeah it's like that's something i that's something i think about now more i'm I'm sorry talking over you there's a little time lag i was just gonna say you know some movies uh you know this definitely you know halloween kills you know because of the uh, the action part of it and the very tight, tight quarters of it. I absolutely had multiple bruises all over my body um, you know, from, from that shooting. It was one of the most physically demanding uh, things I've ever done in my life. And I was a professional figure skater for 25 years. Oh, yeah, um, we haven't even it, talked it, about that yet. Yeah. And, and, and we've gotten, I think we've gotten the wrap it up tech. So we we're going to have to have you back on maybe when the blu-ray comes out we'll have to have you come back on and i would love that i I very much before we stop i absolutely need to talk about the poster behind you (laughs) well because there is a hot ass blonde on there (laughs) and i'm pretty sure that's that's you like well that was me (laughs) (laughs) it still is Hey, that's baby Aliska. Um, so yeah, this is um, this is our poster for Strangest Dreams: Invasion of the Space Creatures, and which came out in 1990. Um, and I mean, it's again had all kinds of incarnations. It was picked up by Troma for distribution. We were originally distributed by Rhino, um, but we also had a run on television. We were on up all night with Gilbert Gottfried and Ron. Nice. Uh, oh for, I think we had a three or four year run with that. And it, it would be so funny because I, uh, you know, it, I just had done this, this feature film and then kind of went into more into radio broadcasting and, and didn't act, but I would get the, I would get friends uh, that would call me up and say, um, on a Sunday morning, you know, where they got in late from the bar and, and they would wake up Sunday and call me like, I have a really strange question for you. <laughs> <laughs> Were you ever in a movie? <laughs> yeah, I swear it. yeah, that's so, so funny. Um, so, that's amazing. I haven't seen this movie. I cannot wait. So you play like it, what, an alien on the run? You're like an yeah. alien being like I'm an intergalactic bounty hunter. Yes. Um, and I am, uh, I kind of come to earth to save the world from the evil Reverend Lash. And the Reverend Lash is an alien from my planet who has come to earth to control the minds of everyone using broadcast frequencies. So he's kind of using that, uh, and, and he's a televangelist. And so he's using the message with these little uh, subliminal messaging to control everybody. And I've, I come to stop him and I enlist the help of a very geeky, dweeby accountant and dentist, and they help me save the world. Oh, this is like, this <laughs> As is like, it t- should be. Just touching my little atheist heart. I love it. It's the feel good movie of the year back in the <laughs> It was. It'll do every year since. <laughs> did did anybody at Halloween know about this? Like, were they no. just like? <laughs> Not unless they went to my IMDb. <laughs> okay. Okay. But but no, I don't. I mean, I I don't think some some types of casting that uh, like Castify, which is a cast you know, they ask for your IMDb, but this particular uh, movie did not use Castify. So I don't think anybody at Halloween uh, knew about about this. But this is, I mean, this thing has come out on 
uh, VHS, a uh, couple forms of DVD, laser disc. Uh, and next year in 2022, it is going to be a full stage musical. Ah! So I had weird. a friend who was in, I had a friend who was in the Toxic Avenger musical. So, uh, Lloyd so they, Coffin it's happening. Lloyd Coffin I actually have sat on multiple panels together. And when we went to New York to shoot this movie poster. I went to Tromaville and, you know, which is just this rundown walk up in New York City. And yep. I went into Lloyd's office and I saw the original casting for Toxie's Head. Wow. Oh my God. I, I watched like a trauma. I just recently watched a trauma a documentary. And so this is- Well, I do have to say, we are not the normal trauma movie. There is actually some semblance of a plot in it. In <laughs> <laughs> so there's that i'm honestly surprised we don't already have this on vhs my husband and i have a obscene vhs collection and now it's it's on my list and i'm okay. sure it's on amazon for 50 dollars um but we'll see i'll find it i don't even think i have a copy of it on VHS anymore. that's what's great i have I'll the you one that's <laughs> okay <laughs> Sounds like a deal. <laughs> Anything. Oh my gosh. Well, seriously, thank you so much. And absolutely, please, if you if you would have us do this again, we would love to to pick Let's your brain even would, further. Yeah. yeah. I would so I would love to because you know it, Brian knows there are so many layers uh, to yeah. to. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I, I know that the steel book comes out, uh, I believe in, in January and interestingly, I'm really super happy to report. They will be using this picture for the inside nice. of the steel book DVD. Nice. So I'm actually the steel book. And nice. you know, if I could only pick one person, one part of, of merch to be on, it would have been the, the vinyl because I'm a crazy vinyl collector. So. Oh, very cool to see that it's I think a, us, a, a, yeah i think you're one. you're in a good trio here i think oh, oh we're all vinyl collectors here so <laughs> in fact when i went i went and got it the morning after after i saw the film and i was the first one at reckless to buy it so i got all this i got this whoa i got a poster i got a bag like because they, they were given one of all this stuff and i was the first one to buy the soundtrack wow wait a second so all this extra i don't stuff. even have swaggy stuff and i have to say but but speaking of soundtracks I, i've never been an abba guy so i've always been like mama mia eh, whatever but i grew up in a small country town of 600 folks out in western new york and ann murray ruled the day so i was always like screw this you, you know mama mia where's the ann murray musical so when big john and little john died and they played can i have this dance i, I was like yes yes so I not only got this, but I had to get the best of Anne Murray too at, at the same of time. Of course. And you know, it, those are two two characters that I did not get to meet because of them working on the other soundstage in the yeah. Meyer house. And I so, I want to find them someplace because yeah, I yeah. love them. I think yeah. they, in I, many I ways, steal the movie, yeah. you know? May, may yes. they do con well, after con. Maybe but I just I like, live off of cons. The one thing that I love is I, I did see uh, that a fan said, uh, <laughs> you know, it's like next time you tell next time you see Jamie Lee Curtis, you tell her she needs to uh, come and get us country gays because you know those city gays. Did they think they were going to take down Michael Myers with a charcuterie not knife? You know, and it was <laughs> hilarious. I thought it was the funniest thing I had ever heard in my life they were high they were high they weren't thinking they've been smoking all night i, know, I almost this is a groovy tune dundee to come out and say that's not a night this is a night you know, kind of thing. It was i am so all fun. for more country gays and horror films so i have to oh dude we should just them. have country gays as like the final girls like yes, there, we there we go i want that for you yeah. and i yeah i'm gonna yeah, make I it happen need, need Nova and Country Gays, and I'll take it. It's a film Space, title. Space Bounty Hunter, Nova and Country, country Gays. I love it. Nova and the Country Gays. Nova and the Country Gays. It's a band, too. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to make that band, too. I can too. see it. I can see it. Yeah, I can start yeah, yeah. to get the vibe. And, and, and since, Aliska, you and I don't sing as well as maybe, you know, Lindsay, like, we'll, we'll be the go-go dancers. I know. I'm all about background and acts. Yeah. 
Yeah. Now yeah. I've got, I can do, I can work yes. the ponytail. There you go. Yeah, it's all about the hair flip. You're going to work wow. the pony for Nova and the country gays. All right, we, we got it all planned out. <laughs> Oh my God. Here. Well, thank you so much, Liska, for so being much. with us. We very much appreciate you. And uh, yes, let's, let's have you back. Yes, Best definitely. of luck with ever with your new project. Thank Steelbook you. in January uh, for more of fabulous um, Aliska walking past Jamie Lee. And yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Oh, hi. It's Caitlin. Um, welcome to a new segment that Brian and Lindsay and Jared have graciously allowed me to do. And we're going to do a little every month. We're going to do a little Caitlin's Corner of Dagger Cast where I'm going to talk about horror television. Because as much as I love horror movies, and I do, I uh, my specialty is television. Specifically, horror television. So every month I'm going to talk about a different subject and we're going to delve deep into some horror TV. I've made a list of what you're in for. Um, this month we're just, it's a little introduction. It's a, hey, what's up? It's a, do you have a horror television show you want to talk about? Contact us at an email address that I don't have, but someone smarter than me is going to put it in later. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, just so you can prepare yourself for the coming months. Uh, we're going to do an episode about Buffy and Angel. I have a lot to say on Buffy and Angel. Uh, we're going to do a Walking Dead episode. That could almost be a two-parter with all its spinoffs. Get excited. We're going to do an American Horror Story segment, which... I mean, that also could be a two-parter. We could do a whole episode just on how Ryan Murphy has um, abused us over the years with what we think is good horror, and then we're just sorely mistaken. But he has some good points, and I'm going to talk a lot about those. Uh, we're going to do a True Blood segment. Uh, maybe we'll throw in some other vampires. I couldn't put True Blood and Buffy together, because while it's vampires, very different. True Blood's much sexier. So that's a not safe for work episode. Um, and then one that I'm particularly excited about is I'm going to do a, a segment on just Stephen King television adaptations where we'll talk about The Stand. Uh, we'll talk about Castle Rock, Under the Dome, all that good stuff. I am a huge Stephen King fan. I don't know if anybody's listened to the other podcasts they have had me guest on, but I do have Stephen King tattooed on my arm, which I'll show those for the people on the YouTubes. Um, check it out. Come over just to look at that tattoo. It's pretty good. Uh, I want to do, we can talk about horror comedies, Santa Clarita Diet, Chucky, which if you're not watching Chucky, please watch it. It's quite good. It's very progressive, and it harkens back to the classic Chucky, which is really great. Highly recommend. Please start watching that now. I'm also going to talk about um, Netflix, because Netflix has given us a whole bunch of horror to talk about. We can talk about uh, Sabrina, or the chilling tales of Sabrina, and uh, Slasher, which, eh, that's interesting. Uh, I don't necessarily wait for the episode to hear my recommendation on Slasher. Uh, that's my dog Smudge, who you might hear every so often during my little pre recorded segments. Uh, I also feel super awkward just talking to you out there in podcast YouTube land and not having a conversation with my friends, Lindsay and Brian, which it's much easier to do that. So. Bear with me while I get my bearings on how to be uh, a, a segment reporter for DaggerCast. Uh, I also want to talk about uh, documentaries and reality and true crime. Because, uh, I mean, horror can be in real life as well. 
And there's a lot of great documentaries on television out there that you might not know about that I'd love to share with you. And I'm going to find all the little shows and things that maybe you didn't know about. And uh, finally... This is only nine, so if they keep me on longer than nine episodes, you'll get more. But uh, I also want to talk about anthologies. And some of the best horror television are anthology series. You all know Tales from the Crypt. That's amazing. Masters of Horror, which I miss to this day. It was so good. Um, Creep Show, which I guess could be in the Stephen King episode. But let's save it for the anthology. And... Uh, many, many more. So I just want to say uh, thank you to your hosts of DaggerCast for having me do this segment. Uh, this is just a, a little warm up so you can get used to my face and my sweet, sweet voice and get ready for Caitlin's Corner, her television corner of DaggerCast, her television horror corner. I don't know. We'll come up with a better title as the show goes on. Uh, vote. But, like, click, follow below. I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to talk with you all. Uh, so you can listen to me talk endlessly for five to seven minutes about TV. Also, if you didn't get a chance, please check out the, uh, podcast I was on, uh, like two episodes ago where we talked about Midnight Mass, which I will end on this note. Midnight Mass is the greatest episodic horror piece of art ever created and everything I talk about for the next nine to 15 months, uh, I'm going to compare to Midnight Mass. Uh, we'll see. All right. Thanks. Bye.